or whatever. Oh, here we go. Oh, all right, all right. They look familiar, man. Yeah, he, he do. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> now we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. What's up? I'm sorry about hey, that. No, no problem, my man. What's going on? I'm good. I'm good. I was waiting for um, a link. So, but it's okay. Yeah, I was just telling Marlon. I was like, yeah, we make you do a little layer work. I apologize about that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I would have been yeah. set up already, man. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm How you doing, good. bro? Thank you for asking, man. I'm good. Who 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 we got here? So listen, my name is Lamio. You you already know Marlon. Uh, yeah, name Marlon. My, name yeah, my but... show is Lamar TV. I was gonna have Marlon start it off, but um, basically on our show it's a Zoom cast, as you see. And what we do is we give people that come on the platform, you know, to give a a story or a little background on what they do, how they do it. Uh, any obstacles they may have overcame. That way you got viewers that may be inspired to do what you do or may be right, right. interested in already in the lane. They can, you know, maybe piggyback or, you know, try to basically learn maybe something from your your testimony, if you want to call it that. You know, let me, give me a second. Let me get some, let me put some light on in here. Got okay. Be... All right. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be sitting in the dark here. Right. Oh, we're a little better, right? There you go. Right, and it's and it's kind of uh it's kind of like faith now because I'm going to a freestyle show this weekend, and I constantly always getting yo why do you go to all of these eighties nineties all these old shows and I just be like listen y'all know y'all know the songs y'all may not just don't know the artist right right yeah you and definitely know, I, definitely know the song what's what what content you going to where you going oh uh, freestyle explosion. Oh, the one. That, okay, I'm doing this show at the end of the month. We're doing the their um, we're doing their uh, um, Palm Springs, and then we're doing the the YouTube Theater Arena the next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That lineup should have been down here. No, we did the Miami last year. You last year, yeah, I was there. Yeah, last so year. and I, I'm there. supposed to do that um that Jungle concert, and then we have another Miami that on that's on hold, and I promised the guy to hold it, so I had to pass on. On the Miami, they wanted us on there, but I couldn't do it. But it's best that we, because what happens when we do those concerts? I love Alan Beck. I love doing his shows. I've been doing them for like fifteen years, but he locks me out of a lot of the market. So if I do Miami, like I can't do, mo or probably all the way up until like Orlando. Really, I'm locked out of that market for you know like 120 days. So I love doing them. They're easy to do. They're smooth, but um. I, I lose a little money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we do them, you know. But yeah, definitely go check it out. It's a good lineup. So, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, good. So listen for so, for the the people in the audience that may not know who you are, you know, okay. or what you do. Give us a little introduction on who you are, you know, what you do, and what you into. Okay, my, my name is Latif Mercado. Uh, I'm a I'm a artist, agent, manager uh, mm -hmm. for a genre of music called freestyle. A freestyle originated. I mean, there'll be people arguing with me, but it originated in the Bronx, New York, in the, in the 80s, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah, that's an argument, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, Miami would be my first ones that, that would be arguing with me. Right. So Miami would be the first ones. Uh, but, um, and then the five boroughs, will, they'll they'll start to, to you know, they'll, they'll argue a little bit. And the style know? out and work his way in. Right. <laughs> so I came up, I came up, you know, I came up in, in, in the 80s and, um, my thing was hip hop, so I was I was a diehard hip hop head from the minute it came into uh, you know it, it evolved. You know, what I mean, that was and that was my goal. And um, I had a great job when I left uh, high school. I had a really good job, so um, I was able to build me a little studio. And at my age, that was, I was like seventeen years old. Uh -huh. um, it, it was like you didn't see that too often, and. Um, the place where, and I lived with mom, so I had no bills. I, all I had was money to spend on shit, you know? No, and no. Um, I used to bring a drum machine. I had an RX-15 dope drum machine. I used to put it in a briefcase. And I used to bring it to work. I, I worked maintenance. And um, I used to run the freight elevator. So I used to plug the drum machine into the freight elevator outlet. And I used to do beats. And these people used to come in, like the workers, because I only did the freight elevator for the workers. Mm -hmm. and they used to tell me, they said, man, what are you doing? I used to let them hear the beats I was doing. And I would rap for them. And, and, and they said, man, you got to meet Tony. They kept talking about this guy, Tony. He's got a daughter who sings. And I'm like, okay, so I'm picturing an old man, maybe with an older daughter. I'm like, 
I not really what I'm trying to do. But okay, you know anybody? I'm 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 cool. But I I didn't get to meet him. And then one day I'm in the loading dock, mm-hmm. and Tony comes up. He goes, "Oh, yo, you're the kid that does the beats in the in the elevator, right?" I said, "I said yeah." And he goes, "Yeah, I'm Tony, man. I have a daughter." I said, "Oh, it's you." Now he was only <laughs> like ten years older than me, so he was young. He was like twenty seven years old, like under thirty. And he said, man, let me hear what you got. And I had my, my Walkman and I had all my raps and my, my drum, all, all, all my beats, all music in there. And I let him listen to it. And he was listening. He's getting into it. And he says, man, can I hold on to this for a minute? I'm like, yeah, I'm just meeting this guy, Italian guy. I said, all right. I mean, he ain't going nowhere. So he, <laughs> he walked away. I didn't see him all day. And I'm, now I'm getting a little panicky. I'm like, yo, this guy like walked away with my Walkman, man, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And um, and then finally he sees me. We run into each other. I'm like, yo, can I get my shit back? I, I gotta go. I don't mind. Can I curse here? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's totally okay. 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 I'm not a cursor, but once in a while it slips. But uh he was um so he's like, yo, man, this stuff's really nice, man. He goes, Let me show you what I do. So he brought me into his locker room and he opened up his his locker, and in there was all these newspaper articles of his daughter. At that time, she was only four years old, and that was little Susie. So you know who she is, okay? Right. So she was only four years old. He says, in fact, he goes, her fifth birthday party is going to be at Studio 54. He goes, why don't you come? <laughs> I said, all right. Now, still, it was cool, but it wasn't really, you know, looking at this little four-year-old girl like, okay, I'm trying to do rap. Like, what are you guys going to do for me? You know, what can you do for me? But right. I went along with it. And I went to, we went to Studio 54. I met them over there. I forgot I had somebody with me. And this girl blew me away. I met the village people. They were hosting it. Um, it was so many acts that night. And it was all for her. It was her party. And she hadn't yet get a record out yet. She was a local. She did a lot of cover songs. And that's when I realized, I said, wait, she's not doing little kid stuff. She's doing Madonna covers. And I was just about Gloria. to say, yeah. Doing yeah, she's doing songs. all the big covers, you know. So she yeah. wasn't doing no little kid stuff. And I remember the one song she did was Love Don't Live Here Anymore by Madonna's remake of it. And man, I, she blew it away. And I'm, I'm watching people cry in the audience. I said, damn. So after, you know, we got back to work, you know, the following week. And he says, man, he goes, I love your writing. He goes, you think you could write like a rap for her? I said, man, I don't know about a rap, but man, I would love to do a song. I've never done a, a regular song. And I went, he goes, man, try it. So I did a song. And at that time, Lisa Lisa's, can you feel the beat was in my heart? That was out and it was hot. And I wanted to get something, something that was similar. And I wrote a song called Get Up. It was very similar. It was like, get up off your seat, get up on your feet. You know, and it had that real kind of movie dancing. And I presented it, and they fell in love with it. And right away, they had me, they let me take it. It was the first time I'm taking someone into a studio, taking this little girl into a studio, could barely read. And we produced it. And we produced it at Tone Zone Studios, which is where they did the South Bronx. So everybody thinks South Bronx was recorded. The South Bronx was born, reported, recorded in Queens, you yeah. know? So we did it there. <laughs> And her mom used to make her these shirts that said, Get Up, the name of the song. And we started doing all the circuit. We did Red Parrot. We did the Limelight. We did Crystal City. We did the Palladium, uh, Club B. I mean, all the entire New York circuit. Then we did the Fun House. At that time, it was Heartthrobs. It was the Fun House. And um, she went up there, and they presented the guy who was promoting that night at the Fun House, because he had a label, her song, the song. He loved her. He didn't like the song. Right. So they ended up doing a new mm-hmm. song for her called Randy. They did a song called Randy. So if you follow little Susie, you'll know at seven years old, she had, this is, we, we, I'm giving it some time now. So time had passed. So by that, no, she was six years old when she recorded because we got released at seven. And what happened was it was 1980s. Queens was off the hook. I got in trouble. I ended up doing some time. And while I was away, I'm in, I'm in my place, I got my headphones on, and I hear the song, and now I'm locked up, and I'm like, and it's like, it blew me away. When I came out, some time had passed, I had another song that I had written for, when I came out, it was talking about three and a half years later, um, her father calls me up, he goes, hey man, he goes, let's pick up from where we left off, he goes, uh-huh. he goes, Children of the World, he goes, the song that you wrote a while ago, that was another ballad that I did, he goes, we want to record it. And that, that was on the Love Can't Wait, and you have to take me in your arms was on that album. And that was the first track. And then from that point on, she blew up. So 11, 11 years old, she already had a hit record. And she kind of took me along with her. 
So oh, when I, you I rode with her and her parents till she was 17, then I took her on solo. What was that? So when you're writing, do you already have like the beat in your head already when you're writing, or you're just like writing it? You know what? Well, back in those days, I don't write like I used to. I write books now. See, I I switch. I do books now. But when I was writing back in those days, it was crazy because it could go either way. Whatever inspired me, I might be playing with the drum machine and I get this dope beat and I'm like, yo, and all of a sudden it'll give me the idea to write something and, you know, hook and melodies will come to my head. A lot of times I would always get with somebody, I always knew guys who were nice with the keyboard and all they had to do is hit certain chords and you hit certain chords and right away I get inspired and I would, and I would you know, write something. I would sing it out in, in blah, blah, blah language and then to put words to it, you know? So you get the uh, feeling. And then it, in other instances, I would just sit down, especially when I was away. When I was away, I had no access to music, but I had a notebook that I used to write and write. So I came out with a ton, ton of stuff. But the, the thing is, by the time I got out, like my world kind of turned around. I ended up more behind the scenes. Right. Like I didn't have that desire to be an artist anymore because that's how I started. You know, I used to go up on stage and rap and open up for her too, you know? Right. But by the time I came out, I kind of lost that desire. And I studied so much while I was away that I really learned a lot about the business. Right, right. And that excited me. Everything from the publishing, how labels work, distribution, marketing, that excited me. And when I came out, I was able to, to use those skills. How, uh, what Was it a challenge trying to build uh, like resources or connects at first when you uh, coming back out, going around round two? Behind yeah, the you scenes? know, um, yeah, you know, because I lived in Queens, right? So I'm from the Bronx, born and raised in the Bronx. I moved to Queens, and everything really was happening in the Bronx. Nothing mm -hmm. was happening in my area. Like, nobody had any connections. I had no connections. So my only connection at that point was Susie's father, who at that point knew everybody because mm -hmm. of the deals that they ran. So they went with Fever Records. They went with High Power. They would distribute by Warlock. They would distribute by Sutra. They did videos. So... Little by little. And then when they went to Metropolitan Records, I actually ended up getting a job there to do marketing. And I always wanted to learn to work. Because I, when I was young, I used to try to get jobs in record companies. Nobody would hire me. Right. And then I had this opportunity, and the, the door opened up, and I went. I started working. I did retail marketing for Metropolitan Records. I was there six years. I went there really to learn because I was running an agency out of my house already. So I didn't really do it for the, for the money, though the money was good. Mm -hmm. I did it because it gave me another level of experience that I, I was never had. Right. Yeah, I learned how to do licensing to like, so we used to do compilations, we used to license and, you know, and I used to have to do all the marketing to, to retail. And then since I traveled a lot, because I was traveling with Susie, I was on the road with either her mom or dad and her. Mm -hmm. So be one or the other would, would go, but I, I you know, because she was a minor still. And, um, and we would go in different states around the country and um, and that's after Take Me and Yarm's hit. So we were able to get into the record stores and I got to meet so many people. We started going to radio stations, record stores. All the DJs wanted to know me because I did the marketing for the label. So they wanted records, they wanted promos. So, mm -hmm. so I built this really, really great. And it really, man, let me tell you something, to this day, it paid off. I could go anywhere in the country and people come up to me. Yo, you remember how you used to service me back? You know, it happened. I just came back from Chicago yesterday, so. You know, same thing, you know, I, I ran into so many people there that, you know, that I, I, you know, I basically now grew up with. I've known them for 30 years. We were all in our 20s, you know. And that's why I asked you that, because I, I was listening to what you're saying. You're basically a one-stop shop. Yeah. You know what? I didn't, I didn't mean it to be like that, but yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> I, I ended up just dabbling in so many different areas that I got my hands. And then I got to be able to pick and choose what I liked. Like, after a while, I didn't like the studio anymore. Like, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I had no desire to sit in a studio for hours like I used to. I didn't want that. Just send me the record. Let's work from that point on. Right. You know? And okay. then a lot of the clubs here. So I'm an agent. That's, you know, my primary job for years have been an, as a booking agent, you know? So I, that's why I know all the artists. I've worked with everyone. Stevie B, Lisa, Lisa, you name them. Shannon. You yes. know? Um, yeah. So I work with all of them. And, uh, and we're close. We're close. It's not like, you know, oh, I, yeah, I think I know. I think I worked on. No, we know each other very well, you know? So, and it built that, you know, you know, being an agent built that. That, that. Well, so it'd be safe to say, like, the whole freestyle community is, 
y'all guys get along. You know, we you know, no, no less, no more than any other genre, bro. Okay. Like, like people always talk <laughs> I'm about. I'm not. I feel There's a lot. Attention. Of, yeah, people start yeah. saying there's a lot of drama in, in in freestyle, and it's not, man. It really is. I mean, you look at hip hop; people getting killed. We don't have that. Nobody. That hasn't happened yeah, yet. Yeah, I never, I never really heard a freestyle beat. <laughs> yeah, but you know they do they do it online, you know. Online, yeah. Yeah, okay. wait till I catch you. I'm gonna yeah. block you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there was because um, you know um, you know as the time went on uh, when I you know I'm married to Angel from the Cover Girls, lead singer. We're together now 20 years. So when I first got with her, I basically had to take her back, take her from another manager who was. You know, pretty much abusing, really abusing and taking advantage. And uh, when I did that, he had a huge, huge following. And that following included fans, producers, or other artists. And But I had to stand up for something because what he did is he took the cover girls and created a fake version. And he put that fake version out there and he promised me he was going to do it. And he did it. And, and he had done it before. And he so was by saying, fake version, by fake version. Three three girls who had nothing to do with the song ever. Got it. Never, yeah. sang, not, never recorded a lick. <laughs> right? So, you know, what happens in, the, in those situations, right? People say, well, why would he do Why wouldn't he just keep the originals? Well, this is how it works. So you got a manager who makes, I'll just throw a number because that number doesn't even apply to him. But let's say a, a manager gets 20% of the group. Mm-hmm. Let's say the group gets $1,000, all right? Right. So he gets his two hundred dollars, right? Because right. he manages the group. But now, if he flips it, the group becomes a work for hire. Now they get the two hundred dollars. Exactly. He gets the rest because they work for him. They work for him, so he can't do that with the original group. Because they so, work. And that happens everywhere. That, I mean, you whenever you see that, and it's questionable. It's like, man, you know, why don't they have the original? Somebody owns the trademark or claims to own the trademark. You know, uh, entertainment law is a hard one. It's very expensive, too. So, wow. yeah, so a lot of people don't want to get into it. Then you're dealing with freestyle, you know. Those artists are not going up there making the bank. They're hip-hop artists. So, you know, a threatened with a lawsuit is pretty devastating to a lot of them, you know. It's 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 a rough one. So they rather just keep quiet and go on and do their own thing, you know. So I ended up in a huge ordeal for, you know, almost – over 15 years, you know, that I couldn't get the girls to do anything. You know, as a matter of fact, it was just Angel. The Angel original cover girl. And we found the originals. We put them together. And, but I did a ton of marketing. I used every resource, everything that I know how to do. And we, we cracked it. So those girls really just stayed. The fake ones stayed basically in New York. And that's it. And now we're going out to April 15th. So we're going to probably put an end to that now, you know. Okay. But, um, but yeah. So y'all, done, y'all done ran up. Y'all done ran into the fake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we've even talked. We've even spoken to them. Oh, <laughs> we try to. We try to. You know, we got to realize they've been. They've been. They've been doing that for so many years. It's like, you know, they. It, how do you tell them to just stop now? You know, what I mean, it's like. So we try to work something out. Not you know where you know you could do this market. You could do, but then it got to a point where the promoters just didn't want to deal with them anymore. It was like, so the only people that would book them would be their circle. The people that they knew, those people, but everyone else is they're going for the originals. I mean, why are you gonna spend that kind of money? And though they, you know, they don't make the same money as the originals do, but and that's one of the reasons why some people will book them for well, a cheaper rate because they cheat. I can get these for you know a fraction of the cost. Well, you, you get what you pay for, and it's just that's, and that's, the only yeah. beef. that's the extent of the beef, really. You know, and then you can never touch the original. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I don't. Get, and see, like, no, I, I can't figure it. Like, so, 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 speaking of that, is there a chance we get all five? Angel, Sunshine, Caroline, Michelle. Arguing? I've had them all at so one time. It, so, yeah, so, no, well, I have. I don't know if you ever seen the picture. Do you have? I have a picture with four of them. So remember, Michelle wasn't a part of Angel's group. Right, right. Michelle was a part of, you know, when they try to re- rebuild it. Re- re- rebuild it. Right. So, but what they did is they did a remake, you know, which 
a remix is a safe bet. So, so when a label does a remake, a lot of times they do it to kind of like, it's almost like to kill, you know, buy some time while they find another original. Right. Because Rolls Royce still wishing on a star, you know, nobody's ever going to do it like them. No, but when you do a remake, it becomes what happens is remakes become great radio songs, That's but nobody really buys them. People don't really buy them, you know? And since they're good radio songs, they help the group and they could get performances out of it. So like right now we got Michelle on board with us, you know? Yeah. So, cause Angel would never sing anybody else's song. So we've never done Wishing on a Star. Angel has, you know, nine, just her, her video records alone, there's nine of them. And we perform all of those on stage, all nine hits. And that's her voice, yeah. you know? Yeah. So when we, in 2011, I brought in, after I had Angel for a while, for several years as Angel OCG, then we pulled in Caroline. We first pulled in Caroline and Sunshine. And then Sunshine had an issue and she had to pull out pretty immediately. So we didn't even get a show and we we're just rehearsing. And we right away we found Margot and we pulled Margot back in. So now we had Angel Sunshine, I mean Angel Carolina Margot, which is like a prime lineup. Like that's the lineup that people that was the touring lineup. Even though Sunshine's from the Show Me video. And she's the absolute original. She didn't tour or do all the other videos like, right. <clears throat> like, like Marvel did. So Sunshine only did the two song video. So she did Spring Love and uh, Show Me. But just the fact that she did Show Me gave her a lot of weight. Did you see us on Wendy Williams? Yeah. All right. So that was a big one because I promised the girls, I said, because they were like, when we're going to do New York, I said, when I bring you to New York, it's going to be huge. I didn't know what, what I was going to do. But I said, it's going to be huge. You and it was, yeah, it was huge. It was huge, yeah. <laughs> and we had to keep that on the down low to the point where the old manager wound up calling me after it aired, trying to get information. I was like, I ain't giving up my resource, man. Right, right. Like, <laughs> you know, not only that, that was the last with, with Michelle Versace and Rem uh, Leah Remedy. That was their last last episode on the Wendy Williams show, and then Wendy Wendy wasn't coming back. Oh, so that's a statement. Oh man, that's that's timeless. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, so that's the absolute last show. And then it became the Sherry Shepherd or whatever they call it now, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so, but um, when I when we did that, the first thing I told the girls, as a matter of fact, I kind of had to deceive the girls a little bit because I didn't want it to, to slip. So I had to tell them, well, listen, we don't, we don't know. We don't have a date. We don't know where, but I need you guys to be ready. I got several dates, but I don't know if I... So I had to kind of leave it like that right. just in case. And then as soon as I had the date, like two days later, I was like, and Michelle couldn't do it. So I, thank God I was able to get uh, Sunshine back on, which was great. It was great to have Sunshine. So we got her on. We flew, because she's up in Albany. We flew her down. You know, we flew Marvel down. And it was me and Angel's first time back in New York in like 15 years. So, and then it was a surprise performance. And, you know, we did a sound check and did a little rehearsal that like that day. It was really cool, but it made a huge impact. And it spun a lot of heads. It was a good timing too, man. The last yeah. show, I said that's a memorable moment. So it's, it is. It'll stick. Oh man, it is. Hey, but, I, well, it was, and it was good. And I promised them there was going to be big. I think it was over well, well over two million people that viewed it. Yeah, uh, the video. It, it should have been more than that. Like, and counting yeah. <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah, probably. And see, that's the thing. What I wanted to ask you is: it anything that um, what's the most inspiring thing you experienced so far doing this in this business? You know, this genre is based on the people who put it together were basically Puerto Ricans from the Bronx. These are, and that's me, Puerto Rican from the Bronx, right? These were, you know, when we were growing up, okay, when I was growing I was always into music. Music, for as far back as I can remember, I had two groups, Jackson 5 or the Osmonds. <laughs> I wasn't either. They were the closest I was getting, more so yeah. the Jacksons. So I grew up, that was my family. That was my ins inspiration. The, the Latin people, I don't speak, my Spanish sucks. So the only Spanish that was in my house was what my mother played. And that was mostly older Latin salsa bands. And I couldn't relate. A lot of them were older, much older than me, you know. And since I had a language barrier, I, I couldn't. I just couldn't vibe with it. You know, I listen to it now. I'm like, okay, it reminds me of mom who's not here anymore. But right. that's it. 
So I didn't have mine. Like there was nothing. We don't realize that till years later. Because when I was young, I didn't realize that. Right, Jackson's right. was mine. Osmond's was, they were mine. I didn't realize that there was a difference. And then there was Lisa Lisa. Yes. And this is what took Lisa Lisa to a whole other area. She was the only one. She was the first one to come out like that. And now we're looking at, we're like, wait a hold up. <laughs> she looked like my cousin. You right. know, it's like, she's from New York. She sounds, she sounds like so and so. She she's Puerto Rican. What and and then she blew up. And and then from there, then you saw the TKAs, and then you saw the cup. And we started, and that's what inspired me because freestyle to me, it wasn't the music. The music, I don't want to dog the music. The music was great. Yeah. But that's not what moved me. What moved me was the machine. The fact that here you got all these Latino kids. They and the reason why freestyle was in English was because a lot of them had a language barrier just like me. Right. But if you listen to the music of freestyle, it's very Latin oriented because we grew up listening to that. So you hear the congas and the percussions, and you can hear that, you know, you know, right. and then you hear that little planet rock beat. That's our hip hop influence. Mm, that, right. You know, so now you got this Latin percussion, all this music on top of this hip hop beat. And then we were like, okay, yeah, we're feeling this. And now we're going to sing a love song like Michael Jackson did, except I was going to sound a little different. And that's what happened. And that's how we got that whole, and then it just, and then other people started loving it. And then other, pe other people started doing it. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, and then the labels picked it up and the majors got involved. And then there was music videos and, and it just took off. And it was so crazy because I caught it just in the beginning, right before it sizzled. But I didn't see my first freestyle music video until I was upstate in the day room, sitting in the day room. It was the first time I ever seen Sapphire, George Lamont, and my wife. What year was that? 87. I was just about to say, because I got introduced to freestyle by going to Galaxy Skate Rain down here. That's all yeah, well, yeah, they, I was going to say that. We didn't realize. Real you know, heavy in the skating rain. We, we just knew 80s. it was like party music. It yeah, was party it was music. just yeah. it feel good music. Yeah, we didn't have a name. We didn't have so, a name. For it. It so like there. Marlon said, like, That's I don't sir. know the names, but if you play the, the song, name came I know years the song. later. The name actually came up, I think, in the, I think the name came up in the 90s. I don't think the name was even there it was dance music. It was dance music, you know? So, yeah, look at I it. always, it I always love, music. yeah, I always love Spring Love, but I never knew who the hell sung the song. <laughs> but Stevie B? Stevie B, yeah, yeah, I know now, but every time it'll come on the radio, I'm like, yo, who sings this? Who sings this? Oh, they go to the next Remember, cover girls have a Spring Love, too. They have yeah, a they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they do. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, come on, why can't you never find the name of the artist, man? Come on. Yeah. I just, Stevie, Stevie B got a new podcast. He just said, uh, I just did his podcast uh, last week, last oh, okay. Thursday. Yeah, it's supposed to end, I think, this week or next week. But, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, Stevie's, I mean, he's the king, bro, really. Yeah, he, he really is. is. He, he, if anybody ever say he's not, uh, you know, not. let me tell you something. People, you know, that that's a big controversy because some artists, oh, they that shouldn't be labeled. It's not about that. I know who you're talking about. I mean, there's a lot of them. I would name. <laughs> there's a lot of them. It's like it's like in in the market. You even get fans. You know, we see like when I tell people, I'm like, some fans call Judy the queen, and some call Lisa the queen, and some call Susie the queen. You know, and there. I don't, yeah, Trinia, and then I don't have a problem with that because my mom was my queen, my wife was my queen, you know what I'm saying? You know, we all have our own, you know, so I never right. had an issue with that. Mm -hmm. And I never, you know, but then, and then people think that Stevie, you know, like gave himself that title. No, that title was given to him by promoters. I remember I'm an agent. I worked with Stevie for many years. So nobody don't know you know. I know numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I know what people make, I know how they roll, I know where they travel, I know how much, how many people they pack in, and I know what cities and states that they do. So I know, I know it on a whole other level. Right. Yes, yeah, Stevie is right way up there, and he belongs closing all of these shows. He's the one that has to close these shows. He has to be the headliner, you know? Yeah. You know? Like yeah. he made a call one time. He I, I called him for a show maybe about a month ago. And this is not the first time I heard I said, Yo, Stevie, 
He was like, what happened to that show at this, in this I think it was D Detroit. I said, I mean, they said they can't afford you. He goes, well, you know, they can't afford not to have me. That's his famous <laughs> quote, you know, and it's true. <laughs> it's true. I get it, you know. So, but, you know, I give him the respect. You know, he's older than all of us, and he has a lot of history, a lot of knowledge. And he did his thing, man. And I think what people got to do instead of, you know, trying to say something is learn from him. He's got a lot to teach us. That's it, man. You know? But other than that, man, I, I mean, I love our community. I think we have a really good, you know, I think we've come a long way. I think the artists look incredible. The girls are, are looking just as fine as ever, all of them. The dudes are just doing their thing. They All their performances are seasoned. They've really became, you know, they know their business. Right. You know, and I like when I just did Chicago, we were just in Chicago. I had Angel, Susie, Lizette, TKA, Suave, somebody else's. I'm missing, <laughs> you know, hey. and then we did the cruise. You saw we did the cruise, what, last month? Man, I was just about it. I was just about to ask you, would you take a residence in Vegas if they offered? You know, It would have to be something totally different. So me and my wife, we have a, a project that we've been working on for a few years that um, that can do a, a residency. But to do a residency for what we do, I think mm -hmm. it's just too much because we do track shows. So the gotcha. only one that, that goes on stage with a band is Stevie. So we can go up there. So in order for us to hold a residency, like it has to be a lot bigger than what we already do. Yeah, so, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, so... so you know, so right now, like you're going to the one this weekend in uh, Miami, right? So they're gonna yeah. have like, eight eight acts on there, something like that, right? So twelve, twelve acts. Look at that. So everybody has approximately fifteen minutes that they're given. Right. They gotta get all their music up in there. Then at the end, <laughs> so the last two they're gonna close are gonna be Lisa and Stevie's gonna close. You know. So are you? Do you guys? Are you guys familiar with freestyle? You know, freestyle. Don't stop the rock. They're familiar. Oh, yeah. Those yeah. are my boys. Yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, with, with, with the whole freestyle, like. Yeah, those are my boys. Every, LB, every, LB. Every, yeah. yeah. Every lineup is, like, a dream lineup. You can't go wrong. Okay, if yeah. I don't see this artist on this lineup, I'm going to be like, oh, damn, well. Okay. Uh, yeah. I see the next 12 people on this show. Yeah. And if I then I get another 12 on the next show and still feel like, I think. Yeah. And that's all see. it is. You know, you can't, you know, people, you can't go to these shows expecting something it is what it is what you know what what it's you know so like i have a newsletter that's out and i have to write an article because somebody tweeted they responded to one of my tweets and they're like they had an issue with um uh the artist singing over track mm -hmm. and i'm like okay i get it we we've all done bands we all have more than enough material to carry an entire concert but what happens is the reason why something like the Freestyle Explosion does well is because they do that. They do the 12 acts on stage. They make it worth that money. You see the price of those tickets. They make it worth it. They can't really do that. It's hard to do that with just three or four acts. So if they're going to do 12 acts, not everybody can go up there with a band. It's not going to happen. Unless we're doing, you know, Woodstock. It's not going to happen. They got four hours. It's too much and moving and going. Everybody got to move their stuff. Yeah, and, and then, then not only that, the promoter runs into a time, there's a time right. constraint. And those penalties for going over the time are severe. I mean, they, they could run anywhere from, you know, $1,000 on up for every 50, in 15 minute increments. That's how they're done. Well, Mr. Mercado, man, I'd like to thank you so much for giving us your time and coming Anytime, on the show. Man. We definitely got to do a round two, man. Um, we'll put all the information in the description as far as what you got going on. Right. And yeah. um, whenever my you have newsletter, the time, my newsletter is very important. So whatever you guys, we'll put it in the description. Right. Yes, definitely, definitely. We'll and we'll promote it through everything too with the YouTube. But Mr. Mercado, thank you for your time, man. Because we're thank running you. out, and I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, we've been <laughs> trying to cut you off. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs>